recipient of the Ruth First Scholarship at the University of Advanced Sarandin, worked at the Idasa offices both in Pretoria and Cape Town, author of many publications in some of the acclaimed journals of the world, much sought after political analyst, essentially for the independent opinion, visiting fellow at the University of Sussex in the UK, Draper Hills Fellowship at the University of Stanford. His opinions on the political scenarios are sought after and respected by business people nationally and internationally. To speak to us to today on the topic, a sketch of the short and medium term political outlook with emphasis on the hopes and aspirations of the people. It gives me great pleasure to call upon a good friend of mine, Ibrahim Fakir. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I'm waiting for the speaker to come from somewhere at the back because that certainly wasn't me. Sitar by Jazakallah. Shukran for that very kind introduction. Uh, trustees of the masjid, respected Imam. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, shukran for having me again. Uh, you did note, Sitar by, that I dressed up. If you don't have the substance, then you must have the style. <laughs> and so I think Bashir has already laid out all of the substance. And I think what is clear from what Brother Bashir is saying is that we have a crisis of government. We don't necessarily have a crisis of politics, and we don't have a crisis of democracy. We certainly don't have a crisis of democracy, but we do have a crisis of government. Now, the problem, though, is even though I say that we may not have a crisis of politics, the reality is that government is a byproduct of politics. So if you had, and if you have, bad politics, you inevitably will end up having bad government. So people might say, on the face of it, on the surface of it, our politics are not that rotten, they're not that bad. Well, actually, there are. Because if they weren't, we wouldn't have the kind of problems that we do in government. And we do have fairly significant problems in government. But be that as it may, I want to focus on four Fs. And I promise you, none of the Fs are a swear word. So the first is, I want to look at the question of the future. I want to look at the question of fear. And I think if Bashir hasn't uh, instilled the fear in you, then, then, then I don't know, you are made of much more steely stuff. So I want to focus a little bit on the question of fear and the future. But most importantly, I want to focus on the root Arabic word fikr, uh, which is the root word for the word furqan. That means the ability to decide what is right and what is wrong. So why do we need to worry about the future? We need to worry about the future for two reasons. The first is that our crisis of government is a crisis which is stemming from the problem of predatory politics. So we don't have patronage politics, which is the kind of politics which happens everywhere around the world. You get into office in order to dispense patronage. You dispense patronage to certain constituencies and certain communities in society. That can sometimes be counterproductive, and it is. But our problem in South Africa is we don't have patronage politics. It would be better if we had patronage politics. We don't. What we in fact have is predatory politics. So people who get into government and use the political process in order to access public office, and you access public office in order to be a predator, and you know what predators do, so I don't need to tell you. That's the first reason why we need to be uh, a little bit, why we need to worry about the future. The second is that we are a community which is obviously rooted in the society. We are a part of the society, and many of us uh, don't have options to look anywhere else. This is the only society that you know. 
and the option of looking elsewhere, uh, Bashir, as you say, there may be captains of industry and others who do so, uh, and that's good for them, uh, but they often speak with forked tongue. They speak with both sides or from both sides of their mouths. Uh, and that's because they don't face the reality of the problems that ordinary South Africans do. And I think many of us, alhamdulillah, are better off than many of our fellow South Africans. But there are many people in the Muslim community who face fairly significant problems because of the government failure and the failures that Bashir was talking about, because they are entirely reliant on those public services. And so if they are unable to access those public services at the level of scale and quality and depth that is required, they, the only other place they can procure it is on the private market, but they can't afford it. And so if they can't afford it, the only place that's left is that the solidarity organizations have to start providing this. So towards the end, I will talk about what I think the community has to do in order to address some of these problems. But let's look at this question of what the political future is, because I was asked to talk about certain scenarios that might unfold. Now, many people talk about the fact that South Africa might be going through a second transition, that there is a move away from the dominant majority that the ANC has enjoyed. Of course, you in the Western Cape, in the city of Cape Town in particular, don't um, experience that because you seem to have a different government. <laughs> Um, but be assured uh, that you live in a province and a city governed by a different party doesn't make you immune from what happens in the rest of the society and the rest of the country. Of course, you may be better off in some respects, uh, but you can be rest assured that what happens nationally will affect both the city and the province. Now, nevertheless, let's look at what the potential futures might look like. The first, as I say, people say that there may be a second transition afoot, and that is that the dominance of the ANC may be broken come the next election. I'm not entirely certain about that, because if you look at the cumulative and compounded decrease in the ANC's performance election upon election from 1999, it is decreased by about 4.5%. Now, the fact that there is a greater deficit in trust and confidence in the ANC means that their average might shoot up a little higher come the next election. So they may settle close to 51% or 50%, which is just over the majority that they will require to be able to form a government on their own. That's the first. The second is that there may potentially be a new electoral system uh, come the next election where independent candidates would be allowed to contest against political parties. Now, there are serious problems with this potential new electoral system. And there may be more thoroughgoing electoral reform in the future, and that potential is, is real. But the reality is that in the next election, even if the ANC dips just below 50%, they might be able to make up the numbers by calling upon certain independents or micro small parties uh, that may be out in the political landscape. And these micro small parties will be too happy to partner with the ANC as you have seen happen in the city of Joburg. And what that does is that it erodes the level of trust and credibility that voters have, not just in those small micro parties, but in the bigger parties as well. So this crisis that I'm talking about, this crisis of government that Brashir was outlining, stems from the crisis of politics. And why is this crisis of politics the way it is? Well, firstly, because political parties are abusing the trust of their voters, as I've just shown you. First. Second, because the parties are unstable and because the parties have internal problems, they take those problems into institutions of government. And so what affects the political party starts to affect what's happening in government. And so when you have these small micro parties coming together with other major parties to give them a majority, it starts introducing two things. First is politicized uncertainty, and the second is institutional ambiguity. Now, 
everything that Bashir was talking about is a product of institutional ambiguity. It's a product of the fact that institutions are not sure about what purpose they must serve. Must it serve the purpose of the public or must it serve the purpose of narrow, parochial, provincial, insular interests inside the party? And we know that it's the latter that often unfolds. It's the latter that happens, that the interests that are being served by public institutions are not the interests of the public they are the interest of private interests, some of them corporate, by the way, in the private sector, who abuse the political process in many ways in order to feed off the predatory and the predation that happens through public institutions. So that's the first problem, institutional ambiguity. The second is politicized uncertainty. So when no party has an absolutely clear majority, and you see what's been happening in the municipalities uh, in, in, in Gauteng, in Johannesburg, in Ekuruleni, uh, and in Pretoria, in Tswane. Those coalitions have been completely unstable. In fact, Johannesburg, I calculated, had a new mayor every three and a half months. Every three and a half months, there was a new mayor. Of course, it's centered around two people. One person from the DA, another person from the ANC. Uh, and eventually, the mayor came from a micro party who was prepared to be used and abused and become an instrument for other political interests. So that politicized uncertainty is what political parties start to use. They politicize because it's uncertain. There's no clear majority. And they use that in order to extract certain gains from the party which they will wish to put into power. Or the larger parties use and abuse the smaller ones to push out uh, a party which may, by means fair or foul, have been elected in government. So the two problems of institutional ambiguity and politicized uncertainty is what the future, unfortunately, might look like in the short term. Is there a way to reverse this? Absolutely. Uh, and the way of reversing it is that each individual has to think about and be concerned, and this is where the word fikr comes from, and this is where the, the word fikr matters, that you have to be, you know, fikr is about contemplation, it's about discernment, it's about thinking correctly, apprehending the reality. And secondly, distinguishing right from wrong. And that should tell you, though, that the parties, the political parties, don't wish to engage in the discernment of what is right and what is wrong because consistently they appear to be doing everything that's wrong. So the only people who can punish them are voters. Now, there's one view which suggests that people might retreat from voting and we can see that in the voter turnout. Voter participation levels are going down. People are losing much more interest in politics. They lose interest in politics because they have a crisis of credibility in the political parties. And I can give you some data. Bashir was giving a lot of data, so I think I'm, I mustn't be left out. I must give you some data too. Ordinary South Africans have very little trust in political parties. Only 25% of South Africans have some level of trust in the governing party. 25%, less than a quarter. When it comes to opposition parties, it's even lower, at 24%. That means in excess of 75% of people don't trust the parties they actually vote for, which means that the crisis of politics is infecting public institutions and institutions of government, which is why the people in office can behave with the predatory interests and the predatory um, mentality that they, that they can because they have not been held to account. In part, they've been held to account by people taking to the streets, by protests, through protests. So I'm not convinced that we are heading for an Arab Spring anytime soon. And we're not heading for an Arab Spring for two reasons. A, is that the Arab Spring has been in South Africa, or the African Spring has been in South Africa for longer than we care to know. So from 2000, from the year 2000, 
there have been on average 200 protests a year in South Africa. You know in July 2021 there was this major insurrection in Durban and Gauteng. Of course you were spared again in the Western Cape. And again here you found that there was the failure of policing and the failure of security and the failure of intelligence. Um, people often quip and say that uh, when you talk about intelligence in government you're actually talking about a lack of intelligence. So the reality is that that is, the, that, is the, that is the political outlook that we're looking at. The coalitions, when people talk about coalitions, are going to breed a greater amount of uncertainty and a greater amount of ambiguity in political institutions. So while the politics may seem okay, while the democracy might seem okay, the government is certainly not okay. And government is not functioning in the way in which it's supposed to. So there's a crisis of responsiveness, there's a crisis of representation. Ordinary people don't feel that their government actually represents them. Like I told you, less than 25% actually have full confidence in the parties that they actually vote for, which is translating into uh, the fact that there's lower voter turnout, that, that people are reluctant to participate. And there is a view which says ethically it's okay not to participate because you've tried everything. You've tried lawfare, people go to the courts, Government behaves with absolute impunity. I mean, it's 30 years later, and we're still talking about children drowning in pit latrines. And you know that there are structural court orders which have been issued to government to comply with getting rid of some of the pit latrines. Uh, and yet the news can report just this week a three-year-old, uh, an additional three-year-old died drowning in a pit latrine. So even structural court orders are being ignored. And the level of impunity, that's the third point. So institutional ambiguity, politicized uncertainty, and impunity, the third, is the characterizing feature of the way in which politics are unfolding. Now, does all of this mean that we should give up? No. Politics is not everything. Um, and certainly Muslim solidarity must mean that we still have a stake and should continue to have a stake in the society. Now how do you do so if government looks so bleak? Over time, inshallah, things might stabilize, but while, things, while you wait for sta things to stabilize, you can't count on it happening in the next five or even the next decade, five or ten years. It might take a longer term to stabilize. What happens in the interim? Certainly the activities in terms of aid, in terms of welfare, and so on has to continue. But that is not enough because those are ameliorative charitable acts which are necessary but insufficient. And so levels of self-provisioning, levels of social solidarity have to start going up. Uh, in the event that you need to provide certain basic services like health care, affordable health care, affordable education, and even things like affordable welfare services for low-income earners in terms of the kind of pensions and so on that they might get, because they don't get many of that, much of that at the moment. So these kind of acts of social solidarity are going to have to start increasing in the, in the face of the failure of government to provide at the base levels of society. And Satarba, you sent me an article, I think it's the same article you sent to Bashir from a big captain of industry, who, and my response was a little less polite than Bashir. Bashir deleted the message. Uh, I was bold enough to say that I think the CEO is talking nonsense. Because while the CEO might be having hope in the fact that you can reverse the problems in electricity, you can reverse the problems in government, you might be able to sustain the debt and pay it off over time if you have a little more austerity. The reality is that CEO is talking nonsense. Because unless and until you reverse the criminal elements and the cartel elements which have begun to take root in government institutions, it is impossible to see any way out of reversing many of these problems. So the unfortunate reality is that though we're going to have politicized uncertainty, though we'll have institutional ambiguity, 
higher levels of impunity, unfortunately, we will, going along with it, uh, going to have the fact that a greater amount of criminal activity, organized criminal activity, including criminal activity of CEOs, white collar crime, which is also going to add to the mix. Because the reality is that government corruption doesn't happen on its own. It is aided and abetted. Uh, and we've heard a lot of this evidence coming from the Zondo Commission report. The unfortunate reality of the Zondo Commission report is that it looks as if the very people elected into public office have decided that if they are going to be prosecuted or if there's any oversight over them, that they will take the whole Commission's report on review. And this individual still holds senior public office, uh, is a minister. If you look at the composition of the national executive of the governing party, there are people who have criminal records, crooks, thieves, uh, violent misogynists. There's a whole range of people represented at the upper echelons of the party. So anyone who talks about reform in the political system, at least in the next decade, is probably looking in the wrong place. And so I'll leave you with the final message, that if you want to think of reform, if you want to think about sustainability, you have to look inwards. It's a very unfortunate reality. It's a reality which no one thought we would be talking about 30 years after apartheid, because it means it's an insularity, there's a looking after your own, that the level of solidarity is only amongst people of a similar kind, uh, across the same race, across the same income groups, and so on. The unfortunate reality is that that is what the political system has pushed people to. And with the proliferation of political parties, with the fragmentation of political parties, with a greater amount of people putting themselves up for office only to be abused by the bigger parties, uh, means that the hope will not in the short term lie in politics and political reform, unless there is a major shift in the mindset in society generally, uh, politics is not unfortunately where it's going to be at. And because that's not where politics, because it's not going to be at politics, it means that reforming government in the next decade is actually fairly slim. I know that's not the note you want me to end on, but unfortunately, if we talk about the criteria of what is right and wrong, we have to face the reality of what uh, is looking ahead at us. Uh, shukran. Assalamu alaikum.